Hey everybody, it's me, your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete, and this is my series, Nails in a Coffin, where we learn that with great kills, there must also come great nails. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel. I'm covering Jigsaw today, which came out seven years after the release of Saw 7 slash 3D, the final chapter. So much for the final chapter, which <laughs> we're not surprised on that one. So not too many uh, movies left to cover in the Saw franchise before Halloween. And if you've been watching my previous episodes, you know I have to cover all of them unless Jigsaw is going to try and do something to me. But it doesn't look like he's going to be able to get me since I'm on track to cover all the Saw films, covering one every Friday till Halloween. I think I'm going to do just fine. I would like to ask if you could do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. I am trying to reach 500 subs by the end of the year. And if you could help me out that, I'd really greatly appreciate it. It's going to take you a second. And I do put out a new Nails and Coffin episode every single Friday. And I have other series as well. And I'll put some cards up here for you to check out. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, real quick, I do want to shout out two buddies of mine, Logan and Wade. Those are the ones who actually gave me my nom de plume of Uncle Pete. So I just want to say hi to those guys. Thank you for all your continued support. So, back to business. Here's a summary of the average nails in a coffin for all the movies I've covered so far in the Saw franchise. First one I covered, Saw, for, Saw I should say, came in with an average of 1.4 nails in a coffin. Saw 3 had a very high average with 2.57. And then Saw 5, 6, and 7 all very close to each other with just around 2 nails in a coffin average for those films. So... I think we should uh, get down the business, sit back, relax, and let's put some nails in a coffin with Jigsaw. You have 11 days, Uncle Pete, and don't forget, if you don't cover all the movies, it will be game over. We begin this movie with Edgar Munson running from police on some rooftops. He stops by, picks up a remote control for a toy car, it looks like, which was taped to a B marked with an X. After he grabs the remote, police catch up to him, tell him to freeze. They order him to put the weapon down, and it kind of does look like a weapon from a distance. He asks for Detective Halloran. It says five more people are going to die. The detective does show up eventually, and Edgar is told again to put it down. And he's screaming, hey, his game, his rules, I have to choose who dies. So time's running out. Edgar says he's not effing dying, and he pulls the trigger on a remote. This causes all the cops to open fire, shoot the remote out of his hand, destroying both. And this sets the timer elsewhere. We'll get to that part soon. And then the cops were ordered to only shoot the remote, but someone's bullet hit Edgar in the chest, gravely wounding him. Now, Edgar doesn't die for this wound, but I'm gonna he died, he's killed a little later on while he's getting care in the hospital. He was in a medically induced coma, and then he was woken up by someone and killed. So there wasn't much he could have done at that point, so... I'm going to count his nails now and give him two nails in a coffin. You know, he was playing Jigsaw's game. He had no other choice. If he didn't play the game, he would have been killed, which is very typical with Jigsaw traps. All he had to do was find the remote and pull the trigger. And this was all part of this movie's Jigsaw's plans. And we'll find out later on in the movie why this movie's Jigsaw put the plan in place for Edgar. So, yeah, he was just following the rules of the trap. And it was actually Logan... Uh, Nelson, who shot him, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Logan wanted him dead, and he definitely got his wish, but I really didn't see anything necessarily stupid from what we saw on these clips, so I'm going to give Edgar two nails in a coffin. Now we move on to see what actually happened when Edgar pressed the trigger on the remote. We go to a room where five people are trapped, each with the shackle around their neck and a bucket on their head. According from John Kramer, it informs them they have to atone for their sins and sacrifice a small amount of blood to escape from this trap. The five people are dragged towards some rotating buzz saws by chains connected to their shackles. And as soon as some of their blood gets on the saw blade, the helmet on the head releases and they can take them off. Four out of five are able to make the blood sacrifice by cutting themselves on the saw blades. The fifth person was just waking up while being dragged across the floor. Doors open up in front of the other fours, pulling them into another room. However, the last person doesn't wake up in time and he's ultimately pulled into the blades. If you've seen this movie, you know that this person was not killed, so there's really no one to nail right now. I said I'd cover the movies. What are you doing? Come on, let me out of here. The four remaining people are faced with their next test. A billy puppet rolls into the room with a tape recorder attached to it. A card on that tape recorder says the word confess, and Billy starts to laugh. 
the chains start to pull up on all four of them, and they soon start to confess things that may have happened, that they may have done, I should say. So Mitch starts by saying he sold the bike to a kid. Ten minutes later, he died in an accident. That's the only confession we get right now. Mitch was able to grab the tape recorder off of Billy, and when he does, the pulleys in front of them fall down, releasing the tension on the chains. They all see that the chains are now going to pull them up towards the ceiling and hang them. Three syringes drop down from the ceiling, each with a set of numbers on them. Mitch plays a message on the tape, and it says that one of them was responsible for the death of an asthmatic woman. This person stole that woman's purse. The woman cannot get to her in an hour in time, and this caused her to die. This is an easy one. Don't have to spend much time on this. The asthmatic woman, who's unnamed, is going to get a pass. She did nothing wrong. This other individual stole her purse. She couldn't get to her in her hair in time, which she needed actually to survive. So nothing she did wrong. So easy one, giving her a pass. The message on the tape continues, and it tells the group that the culprit has been injected with the poison. Of the three syringes, one of them has the antidote, one has a saline solution, and one has an acid that's just going to melt you from the inside. All they have to do is inject themselves with the antidote and the chains will be released, saving everybody. So the hint is given how much is the price of one person's life. And we learn that the person in question is Carly. Ryan shows her the numbers on the syringes and she sees that one of them says 3.53. She comments $3.50, which is all the money she got from that purse. She refuses to inject herself with the syringe, not trusting what is said on the tape. The chains are pulling them up and they're all going to be hung. Ryan's pissed Carly won't do anything, so he jams all three syringes at the same time into her neck, pressing down on the plungers. The shackles on her neck release, and they all drop down to the ground. And then we see Charlie, who's leaking blood from all over, and she's killed. I'm going to give Carly one nail in the coffin. She knew what syringe to pick, but she didn't trust it that that's the one that was going to save her. She thought it was just going to melt her from the inside. You know, all she did was nothing, which was going to result in everybody's death, all four of them. So she was going to 100% die if she did nothing. And the other three people that she was with were going to 100% die. But she had at least a 33% chance of surviving. And I could say that I'd rather have a 33% chance of surviving than a 100% chance of death and killing three other people at the same time. It's simple math. It was either all die or you take your chances and die. And she knew which syringe to pick. While it was not an easy decision, it was the only logical decision she had, and I can't see her getting anything other than one nail in the coffin. Next up on the chopping block is Mitch. The three Ramming people head to their next test. Ryan is incapacitated from a previous trap where he had to sever his leg to save the other two. No one died in that trap, so there's really not much to cover for nails in the coffin. While Anna was treating Ryan's injury in the next room, Mitch finds an audio tape with his name on it hidden in an old car. When he hits play on it, his feet get tangled in a snare trap and it pulls him towards the ceiling. The recording reels that Mitch knowingly sold a motorcycle with faulty brakes to John Kramer's nephew, who died in an accident. Mitch is slowly lowered into a funnel with giant spinning spiral-shaped blades in its center. And his only way to stop the machine is to save himself, and, and save himself is to pull a brake handle beneath the center of the blades. Anna tries to help him by jamming something into one of the wheels and it stops the blades momentarily, but... That piece of metal snaps, the wheels spin even faster, Mitch is caught in the blades, time runs out, and he is mutilated. First up, I'll cover John Kramer's nephew. He's getting a pass. He bought a motorcycle thinking it was in working order. He only did was trust somebody. He wasn't speeding. He was wearing a helmet. He didn't have enough time to do anything once he realized the brakes weren't working. He was probably an inexperienced rider, just a novice, but I'm not going to take that into consideration because this was 100% Mitch's fault. He didn't do anything wrong, so John Kramer's nephew is getting a pass. Mitch, yeah, he's definitely not getting a pass. I'm going to give him one and a half nails in a coffin. Now, first, he had one nail in a coffin, but after some thought, extra half a nail just because it was so difficult. He was doing well on the start. You know, he kept himself straight as possible after getting nicked one time. He didn't stop. But once he had his moment that he wasted, that's why he's getting one and a half nails. Anna had the blade stopped. He should have gone for the break. His fingertips were right there. He could have reached it and stopped the damn thing and then been helped to safety. But he was prematurely celebrating. It's a common occurrence of deaths in horror movies when people do that. So that's a big fault of his. If he didn't do that, he may have had a better chance of surviving. But he did celebrate too early, which is why he's only going to get one and a half nails in a coffin. Come on. I'm sorry. After Mitch was killed, Anna uses a shovel to break a lock on a door to the hallway. 
There's a chain on the door, but there's enough room for her to squeeze her body out of the door. Once she's halfway out, she's stabbed in the chest with the syringe by a man in a pig mask. We're then going to see Anna and Ryan wake up in a room with one of their legs chained to the wall. There's a man in the hood setting up a contraption, and once he pulls it down, spoiler alert, it's John Kramer. Yeah, this part of the film actually took place 10 years earlier. He tells both of them they're about to play a game, and we learn from Jigsaw that Ryan's responsible for three deaths from a car accident that he caused when he was acting like a drunken idiot, which caused the death of three people. I'm going to give all three of them a pass. Nothing was their fault. If Ryan wasn't being a drunk, selfish asshole, none of this would have happened. You know, he lost the control of the car when he was trying to save his friend Ryan from falling out. Ryan was even being more of an idiot saying, leave me alone, I'm, I'm not, whatever. So yeah, it's just frustrating when you see something so freaking stupid and selfish. But none of these victims did anything wrong, so they're all going to get a pass. We see why Anna was selected by Jigsaw. She was John's next door neighbor, and he knew that her marriage was not on the best terms. She had a new baby. Baby was screaming, and she couldn't take all the screaming. So in a fit of rage, she did something horrible. Then she even did something more disgusting. She blamed it on her husband, saying that he rolled over the baby in his sleep and smothered it. So the police took him away. He was taken to a psychiatric hospital where he was devastated by the guilt and for what he thought he did. And this caused him to unalive himself while he was in that facility. I'm going to skip over these deaths considering the situation. I don't like rating deaths like this. Just doesn't feel right for me considering the situation. So not much else to talk about here. Not even, don't, not even going to give them a pass. So moving on. John sets up the final chat for these two remaining horrible people. He places one shotgun shell in a shotgun and tells them both that here's the key to your freedom. And it's up for the two of them now. Jigsaw leaves the room. Anna gets up, goes for the shotgun, knowing she has an advantage since Ryan only has one leg. Ryan is telling Anna not to do this. Wait, you know, let's figure this out. She thinks she has to follow the rules. So she picks up the shotgun. Ryan's cowering. Anna fires the shotgun. But, oops, the shotgun backfires on her. It was gimmicked and she has killed. You know, Jigsaw definitely has some interesting traps, and some of them are not the easiest to rate. I had to sit on this one for a minute, and Anna, I believe she earned herself one and a half nails in a coffin. Now, don't get me wrong, she's a horrible person, which is why she was in this trap, and deservedly so, but I don't want to take deserving to get killed too much into consideration. But she didn't learn anything from the previous traps. You know, she thought it would be just as easy as shooting Ryan. Was she not paying attention to the concept of these traps that she already had survived. Now, we knew it wasn't going to be an easy jigsaw trap, but she didn't think it was going to be that easy. Just, oh, to atone for your sins, kill somebody else. It, it, it didn't make any sense there. Yeah, she was a frustrating character. She did some smart things, like she went to help Mitch, but then she did something really stupid, which is why I'm giving that added extra half an hour because she did show some intelligence when she was trying to help Mitch out, but not enough. The highest I can do is give her one and a half nails in a coffin. Alan's laying on the floor thinking he's saved since Anna shot herself with the gimmick shotgun. Then he sees a broken key amongst the broken apart parts of the shotgun. Jigsaw meant what he said when he held up the shotgun shell saying, here's the key to your freedom. And we last see Ryan laying on his back, looking up at the ceiling, apologizing for everything he did. Getting close to the end of the movie here. Only one more death after we nail Alan. And I'm going to give him two and a half nails in a coffin. Now, granted, he was a horrible person for keeping these secrets, but he already lost one leg in a trap earlier in the movie that he did sacrifice that leg to save Anna and Mitch. And at the very end, he knew he couldn't get to the gun first because of his injury. However, he did try to talk it out with Anna first. They had time to figure things out. I don't believe there was a timer unless I missed it. There was no timer on this trap. So if Anna didn't rush into her decision, they could have gone over what John had told them. There was a chance there, and at least Ryan wanted to take a minute before making this bad decision. He wanted to figure things out first, so that's why I'm going to give him those extra nail points. And he survived one trap earlier, which is why I think two and a half nails is pretty fair for Ryan. Our final set of nails go to Detective Halloran, who was subdued by an unknown attacker while he was investigating the barn where these deaths had occurred. Sometime later, he and Logan wake up in a room with collars locked around their necks, armed with lasers. Over the loudspeakers, John Kramer's voice urges them to confess their sins, allowing them to choose who goes first. Pressing a button between them, Halloran makes Logan go first. Logan was a former resident at a hospital. He admits that he accidentally mislabeled John's x-rays, which caused John's brain tumor to remain undiagnosed. But Logan's head is seemingly sliced apart by the lasers, 
Afterwards, Halloran desperately admits that he took bribes and allowed numerous criminals to avoid their rightful punishment. And then the lasers around his head actually turn off. Here comes the big twist of this movie. Logan faked his own death. He gets up from the floor and tells Halloran that he just recorded all his confessions. He was a man pulled from the saw blades at the beginning of the movie. John saved Logan at the end, realizing he just made an honest mistake. And Logan became Jigsaw's first apprentice until he enlisted in the U.S. Army. Logan turns on Halloran's device on the lasers. And Logan reveals that Edgar Munson actually killed his wife. And he blames Halloran for her death because he helped Edgar avoid prison. While Logan leaves the room, Halloran's head is sliced apart by the lasers. Logan says, I speak for the dead and slams the door shut. The final set of nails go to Detective Halloran, and I'm going to give him one and a half nails in a coffin. He was a dirty cop who took bribes and allowed criminals to get away with word or just for profit. Now, granted, the trap he was in was inescapable, but his actions did put him in that predicament. It just didn't feel like a two nails in a coffin kill. He kind of deserved to be there. He had no respect for human life, which is why Jigsaw put him in this trap. He actually deserved to be there. And... Yeah, the trap was inescapable, but I'm only going to give him an extra half a nail for that. But yeah, his actions directly led him there. So I'm going to give him one and a half nails in a coffin. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Those are all my nails in a coffin for a jigsaw. Here's a summary of all the nails I've awarded. This is how the first eight movies compare with their average nails in a coffin. Only one more movie to cover. So, looks like Saw 3 most likely is going to win for the highest nails in a coffin average. And Saw 2 is the current frontrunner for the lowest average nails in a coffin. And the others are all pretty similarly close together, at least, you know, somewhat consistent. Which makes sense for all these traps. Well, I'll see you here next week when I cover Spiral, the book of Saw. Which is going to be a first time watcher for me. I haven't really checked it out yet. So... Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss us now in this entire franchise. And you're also going to get to see me escape Jigsaw's trap since Spiral is the last Saw movie in the Saw franchise to cover. And I still have a few days left until Halloween by the time this video goes out. Covering one every Friday. Yeah, I don't think he's too smart. What is that? What are you doing doing? Take care, stay safe, and be good to each other. I am your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete. And remember, with great kills, they must also come. Great nails.